our Japanese managers are always pleasant. He said, Mr. Hopper, you said, within their own company, Japanese managers are not always pleasant. <laughs> so um, this is Ben Simon in Oe, and uh, I feel that, in a way, we have to decide who we want to learn from at that important period when management skills were learned in Japan. Obviously, we can learn from Dr. Deming. Peter Drucker was very influential, and uh, we can look back to Peter Drucker's practice of management. It's a little, like, a lot of very good stuff in it, but perhaps we should be looking at a little bit more at what the Japanese executives did with it. Uh, Mr. Inoue is always very modest. He says that you know he wasn't a leading figure. According to Mr. Inoue, there's only one person in Japan who deserves absolute praise for what he did for Japanese management, and that's K. Machusta, Kanuski Machusta, the head of Machusta. You know the old gentleman. He's the one outstanding person. But Inoue clearly has this remarkable long history. He had the long history right back from the 40s at the time of the occupation, through the sharing the material, through the developing QC circles, through teaching others. And since then, uh, until close to the end of his life, he was chairman of a top management study group in the Osaka region, which looked at management methods. And I would like very much to find out more what happened in that, because I think they did some very useful work. So here he is. Can we move on and uh, see what else happens? And uh, this is rather a random lot. I told you about this chart that in no way gave me, uh, the statistics he gave me of the presentations that they made, like this kind of thing, and how in 1959, when they decided to apply for the Deming Prize, they brought the foreman in and the senior foreman. And you can see this huge push up in presentations, obviously the foreman and the senior foreman responding. And this almost entire increase comes from the, the presentations at that level. And uh, from that level, <coughs> the foreman were teaching it to the workers. So no one can say exactly when the thing moved to the... This is, this is exactly the same that happened to Procter & Gamble. I started in 57 with the foreman, but within a couple of years, it had moved down to the worker level. So obviously, the same thing was happening there at the same time. Next one, please. Um, I, I just threw these together. Uh, when we went there, we were in, uh, in October, and you're probably aware that November is the is the great month in Japan for quality, when the work factories each put on their jamborees and the various workers group. But Mr. Inoue is so much respected that he was able to ask one of the factories to put it on a month early for us, and they put it on a month early for us. And this is one of the workers um, explaining what they did, and we had a translator. Next slide, please. Um, just a, a little bit of it. Mr. Inoue had thought a lot about management and could contrasting American and Japanese management. This is a little diagram he gave me. He felt that, first of all, that the Americans, what the Japanese had really learned from the Americans was the science of management. He felt that there had not been terribly much American influence on developing QC circles. Uh, but uh, this is quite a different subject. Here he's saying that, his, that uh, at the bottom level, he said in Japan, it is all scientific management. In other words, planning, production control, standards, this is all, this is the key to Japanese management at the bottom level. But he said, as you go up into middle management, it, he felt that in Japan, there was more art of management and less scientific management. And that the higher you got, the more you had the art of management in Japan and the less scientific, compared to Japan compared to the USA, that Japan at the higher levels had less science of management and more art of management. Okay. okay. Um, he uh, argued, and I think this is quite an important little argument, that the weakness that had come out in America was that American society was what he called articulated. And this meant that there wasn't a great deal, a great deal of overlap between you and the lawyers and the salesmen and so on. Whereas in Japan, this, I mean, we all know this, that where people tend to discuss things in groups and you sort of everybody gets to know about what's happening, he called this a monolithic society where you had this kind of overlap between functions. And it was his argument, he said, the greatest constructive work takes, at this, takes place at these overlaps. So he contrasted this, what he called Japanese monolithic management, with American articulated management. And this, again, I think ties in a bit with what I am saying about my experience of being able to write that article when the great economists in Washington were under the impression that American factories were full of, of new equipment when they weren't that this intellectual side has become, it has become so articulated that there's not a great deal of overlap between them. Um, so here was his simple diagram of overlap, and then you could, once you put a whole together in a bigger organization, you get this overlap, which he said is a much stronger type of way of working. Next slide, please. 
I um, felt that I, d I did my own little bit. I felt that in Europe, what you did have was a, a very rigid structure, that perhaps not so much separated as America, but very rigid at the boundaries of each production control, industrial engineering, and so on. Um, and Protzman's description to me of Japanese management in the early post-war years, when he went there, he said the departments don't talk to one another at all. Each one exists separately. So I made my own little diagram for Japan in the early post-war years. Um, this really is stuff that you've heard about so often, you know, seniority system and overlaps and homogeneity and such like. I think we'll pass on from that one. Um, this is a, just to remind us that it's off, you often hear it said that, you know, teaching workers statistical quality control. Well, I mean, I've looked at many, perhaps hundreds of the presentations that the JUSE send out that workers have done in Japanese factories that they've translated into English. And I've never seen a statistical quality control analysis in any of them. But you do find the Ishikawa diagrams all the time, and you find the Pareto diagrams all the time. But to say statistical quality control, they just don't appear very often in QC circles. So you cannot say that it probably came from Deming statistical quality control, statistical statistics treat, teaching that led to QC circles. Certainly, it's not evident in the QC circles that you see in Japan, or at least when I was over there. Next one, please. Um, just to talk a little bit more about Mr. Inouye, he was one of this older school. There is no doubt when you went into it, when Mr. Inouye arrived in a room, everyone stood and bowed. Everyone stood and bowed to him. He was one of the great figures. Um, and yet, he still lived in this one of these little houses down here where he had lived since the days when he was factory manager in Osaka and where you had to cycle to work. It was the only way to get there. So it meant he was really in quite a working class area. And this is what we've all heard that, you know, the Japanese executives of that, of that time anyway, there wasn't the same salary differential between the top and, and the worker level, and uh, that they tended to live in, in working class area, what we would call a working class or middle class area. So his house is one of the, I don't know, can't point out which one it is, but it was one of these ones. And I, part of his little interest in myself, I had written to him that um, he said, I would like to organize a tour of Japan for you. Please let me know what kind of hotels you would like to stay in. So we had written back and said, pretty economical. So uh, for some time, nothing happened. Then we got a little, I thought I'd offended him, or he, did, you know, he wasn't pleased. But I got a little letter from him. He said, Mr. Hopper, it so happens that I have an apartment which my grandson uses near me. I'd be very honored if you and Mrs. Hopper would use this when you're staying in Osaka. So we finished up. Next slide. It's probably here. We finished up in, in this apartment. And, and I've used this more for amusement than anything else. But you know, the Japanese, when they live at home, they're, they're not our size. And this is my wife here. And she's, she's quite normal. She's much shorter than I am. But we finished up in this little uh, charming little apartment. And uh, you know, this is part of my little relationship with Mr. Inoue. Next slide, please. And this is the apartment. Th these, I can assure you, are kind of tiny chairs. But we were very glad to have them. Next one, please. And just to say, I feel it's tell you just a little bit, Mr. Inouye. Um, he's obviously a very charming gentleman. I'd say tough-minded as well. It's, uh, uh, according to Sakamoto, uh, he was the locomotive, he said, that drew us through the difficult post-war years, Mr. Inouye. But um, I always kept writing to him and say, if we finished up with 50 letters and huge documentation, uh, I, I would always ask him things about how many seminars did the, um, you know, the electronics companies put on, and how many did somebody else put on, and how many people attended, and so on, and how many people attended the course in Tokyo, and how many. The, so eventually, one day, he sent me this photograph of himself. He said, and on the back, he had written, photograph of Mr. B. Inoue singing with prominent Japanese musical star, something, something. He said, and in brackets underneath, he said, there were about 160 in the audience. <laughs> So um, I kind of felt he was like a, an affectionate sort of grandfather again. So next, please. This is just the words in the bottom where he says that with prominent singer Miss Marie Osono, he had written this in the back himself, number of audience, about 150. <laughs> next, please. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen a fertility shrine before, but um, <laughs> this is what they look like. Well, we weren't there. Uh, next one, please. Uh, these are some of the, some of the worshippers. Some of you may make out what they're carrying. It's, it's probably not what you expected to see at this lecture. Next slide, please. And these are some of the priests, some of the high priests, shall we call them, of, the, of this particular cult. 
carrying the, what they're worshipping on top of their heads. Next, please. Okay. Um, it just, uh, we'll go very quickly. I just took a few odd slides I'd taken that, um, it's, uh, at the time I made this slide series, nobody talked very much about the little Japanese farming communities, but when you did travel in Japan, you could see how, uh, until fairly recently, the Japanese did live in very small communities where they obviously had to work together and they were separated very much from the next community across the hill. Next slide. Um, we talk a lot about um, Japanese and Buddhism. I, I got a feeling when I was over there, we might well have a look at Shinto, not the state Shinto of the, of the fascist uh, period, but the um, sort of homely Shinto where people sort of feel at home with waterfalls and, and rivers and countryside. That is really a very pleasant sort of thought, thing, I thought, and pleasant places to go. Um, the next one, please. There's just some little girls. It's not a very good slide. Well, it's not very good with the lights on, but you can see them, young schoolgirls, clapping their hands and sort of saying a little prayer. Next, please. Uh, again, a nice photograph of Mr. Norway. Next, please. Um, nothing of any great organized thing there. I just accept, um, as I say, this middle management importance in Japan. You can put together, I will just pass on past that um, again. Um, I don't know if you'd like to see a Japanese productivity graph of how it looks to them. This is Japan, of course, and this is Britain and America down at the bottom competing for low productivity. Next. Um, uh, uh, um, next one, please. It, just something that amused me to do. I'd heard of uh, tr training for Japanese foremen, and in one of the steelworks I visited, they said that all their foremen uh, could handle calculus. So I said, you know, let's just be sure of this. And I, I got a copy of the exam that they passed. And that impressed me more than just the words. This is, it's, it's, it is very elementary calculus, as those of you who remember your elementary calculus will recognize, but it's, no, sorry, this is not calculus. The previous one was. This is something, I think this is just factorization, and it's elementary algebra, but it's kind of impressive they could even handle that level. These were mostly people from the shop floor. Yes, please. And, oh, this is another, this is part of the American techni technology. I, I worked for a while at Waterloo Village and uh, it was kind of interesting, it interested me very greatly that the early American farmers developed these broom machines. They were not made by factories. This is something the farmers developed themselves. And this is the, Ameri you know, this is the Amer early, early American technical approach. I'll carry on. That was the last one. Okay. Do you believe to hear that's the last? Well, thanks very much for that interesting tour of some of uh, <laughs> ATT's contributions and, and uh, Japanese quality, not least for uh, for telling us that PQMI really began about 360 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> with the Puritans. But yeah. Thanks very much. And uh, you know, I'm sure if there are any questions, so I'd probably be glad to answer. So. <laughs> well, it's a very pleasant surprise for me to find so many people taking an interest in this material. It's, I found it very interesting up to now, and I enjoy very much talking about it. <laughs> I do think, uh, just in conclusion, I would say that uh, AT&T's contribution to Japanese management after the war, I think, was so great that one could be justified saying that it was, uh, the Ma Bell was also mother to Japanese post-war management. I mean, this was an immense contribution, and there's a huge documentation down in Suitlands waiting to be studied. Uh, all the records of how they handled the communications companies and the communications companies were the only companies that got this, this help. So that, and so obviously all the help came from AT&T. And then it was subsequently shared amongst all the, all, the, all the rest of industry. Now, other industries did get help. I mean, people, the steel works got help from steel companies here. The shipyards got help from Kaiser and so on. But it was the electronics area that got the big help and then shared their know-how with the rest. So, and that all came from AT&T originally. So there you are. Any questions or <laughs> I have one, something you said that's intriguing. I don't understand the rationale for instituting a quality award at the end of 1950, so only when they were trying to get on track. Do you have any kind of background on why they did something like that? Oh yes, it's, um, they had become very aware of just how bad Japanese, you know, the pre-war made in Japan meant, meant pretty well rubbish, except in one or two areas. 
Um, I mean, art has always been high standard, but uh, basically Japanese manufacturing w was very poor quality. And this was part of their campaign. The JUSC has been a remarkable organization in what it's done. Right at the beginning, the first thing was to get you know, standard quality control going, including statistical quality control. And the JUSE was, was really the leader in that, uh, bringing Dr. Deming to lecture, um, developing its own quality control com committees. And then the second big step, worker participation in quality, again, the JUSE was the leader in that. It was their magazine for the foreman that, uh, th that led in it. But uh, it was very apparent to the Japanese at that time that they must get quality improved. And the JUSE, a very sensible body, thought that uh, making an award for it would be a fine way of, uh, 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 of encouraging companies to do so. So that is why they have to be credited at uh, getting it going so early. So it's on the front end of the movement? Oh, yes, oh. yes, 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 yes. How did that... How is it that Pulkinghorn and Potsman and Saracen were chosen? You know, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, <clears throat> well, it's... Uh, I mean, I think AT&T was just asked to send somebody. But uh, uh, something which I think is rather interesting, I mean, to me this is interesting. It's all too easy when you're sending somebody to send somebody who's not first class. But this was an exceptional circumstance. Uh, but, uh, let's say not just, uh, it's, I mean, I'm not, I assume that one would not send somebody who's incompetent, but you can send people who are competent, or you can send some of your first class people. And the attitude of the Americans after the war was very, very generous. You know, when I arrived as late as 1965 and was at Harvard, I had only to say to some of the executives I met there, you know, I've never seen a, an American factory of this kind. And they would say, well, uh, I mean, this happened to me with Diamond, uh, Diamond Shamrock. I said to a guy from Diamond Shamrock, you know, it's, um, I haven't been to the Midwest at all. And this fellow said, well, why don't you come and visit our factory? And I said, well, I'm kind of short of funds, you know. And he said, well, he said, why don't you come and give a little lecture? I can give you enough to, uh, to pay your fare. And I said, but you don't realize I just don't, uh, the, the, the British tr regulations, I haven't got the money, and anyway, I'm not allowed to bring it out. Oh, he said, you don't understand. He said, I'll meet you at the airport. You'll come and stay at my home, and then I'll take you around and give you a lecture, and then you travel back. But there was this great openness and anxiety to teach, tremendous generosity of the Americans at the end of World War II. And uh, when the, obviously, when AT&T was told what it was, that you know everyone knew Japan was destroyed, it was an obvious thing to send out some very competent people. There couldn't be a greater disaster than Japan after the Second World War. So that, uh, I mean, Polkinghorne, I have references to him here. He died, as you know, last year. And he apparently he was a, a you know, very highly regarded individual, many papers. He was in charge of um, some important part of developing trans-oceanic radio um, in the World War II period. It was, um, uh, and also uh, an interesting little sidelight, they paid. I mean, not only did they, they release them, but AT&T paid the salaries of these people out in Japan for years teaching the Japanese. Another little sidelight on the CCS seminars was that um, uh, the Japanese insisted everything, in the, uh, the Japanese of that era generally didn't understand English, even the top executives. So the thing had to be all translated for them, which meant that everything had to be written down. And I have somewhere around here, here they are. And this is Protzman's original copies of the CCS seminar. They had to be translated into Japanese. But the Japanese executives insisted that the seminars be given to them in English, even though they wouldn't understand them. And um, obviously, it's part of the sort of personal contact they wanted. They wanted to see what kind of people these were and so on. And I think that's rather important. It's, uh, and that's why I'm pleased that Dr. Deming's getting around these days. You'll see what these people were like. So does that answer your question? Oh, well, actually, that's not your question. That's a little bit I threw in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Jeff can make copies of, uh, Jeff has copies of these articles and... Yeah, there, uh, one is uh, Human Resource Management in the summer of 1982, uh, called Creating Japan's New Industrial Management, <coughs> and another in Quality Progress in September 1985. But I could get those. Yeah, sure. mm. It's probably best if you do, because there were a couple of misprints slipped into it, and I've corrected these ones, so this is better than the, these are better than the originals. <laughs> 
All right, well, it's close to lunchtime, so I guess we should wind things up. But thanks again, and thank you all for coming. Mm. If anyone wants to look at some original documents from the CCS period, they are here. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, on. Good, <laughs> Good to see you. You're looking well. Yeah. So, we I, I've spoken to Lorraine on a few occasions. Yeah, that's right. You were going off to England. I think. Yeah, we had a nice couple of yeah. couple of weeks there.